G'day and welcome to this short screencast on analysing time series data. Uh, why would that be of interest? Well, as a wise man once told me, to measure is to know. And uh, in our line of work in engineering, um, we understand that if we can measure the response of a system, then we can come to know uh, just about everything about that system. So we often find ourselves with a lot of time series data and, um, uh, and, and are looking for ways to analyze it effectively. And uh, I just want to take you on a little journey I've gone on recently in understanding uh, how you might apply the right tool uh, for a particular job, uh, because it does vary. So I'm going to talk about um, a couple of tools. Uh, these are not recommendations, but these are, are good examples of the various ways that you might tackle time series data. I'm not going to introduce the tools though, so for reference, uh, here's um, where you can find out more information about these tools. Primarily I'll be talking about InfluxDB, uh, GNU Octave and Jupyter. Uh, and if you need to get in contact with me, then by all means my email address and uh, Twitter handle uh, are there on the screen. Okay, so let's start with the first example. Uh, this is some um, time series data we collected on a wind turbine that uh, we've been working on uh, the controller for. And uh, it is visualized here in a popular package called Grafana, which is commonly uh, coupled with InfluxDB. Anyone that's used these tools will instantly recognize the, the styling um, of this graph. Now, this is a, a very powerful tool uh, in combination, the Influx and Grafana um, package together. Uh, are immensely powerful and, and we've um, had the opportunity to develop uh, some um, some great skills in, in deploying these systems and, and using them to great effect. Now here we see uh, classic time series data of signals varying over time and you can see what uh, is being represented here is a, a period of a day where not much happened in the morning and then some uh, wind picked up in the afternoon and then there was a brief and exciting um, windstorm uh, that might be of interest to us. So something there suggests that, uh, that we might be interested in, in learning more about how the system behaved um, at that time. And visualizing data in this way uh, allows you to do things like zoom in. Um, so if we zoom into that section, then uh, again, we start to see things in a different light uh, with a different perspective and instead of it being a short violent burst there is a lot going on within this short time period in right here knowing what I already know about the system I recognize that there is something new there there is something worthy of greater scrutiny that's going to teach me something so uh, of course I can continue to zoom in and um, start to plot um, some extra information on, on the graph so this is nothing too um, extraordinary uh, this is as you would expect uh, to be able to do with time series data, but um, by by spending a lot of time with these tools, we can um, we can use them very effectively and, and uh, get these visualize hap visualizations happening very quickly. Uh, a couple of things to note here is those that are familiar with time series uh, databases will recognise that often they are equipped with the ability to aggregate data over time. So you can perform aggregations like uh, maximums and means or averages over a particular time, which is a very effective way of dealing with more data than you can manage uh, at one go. It allows you to um, uh, zoom out, create aggregations, find areas of interest, and then zoom in and get more uh, fidelity on the data. So here we can start to see the coincidence of events and the lead up to events. And they're two factors that uh, can teach you a lot about how a system behaves. Um, so this becomes a very, very effective tool for uh, pulling out that sort of information. Um, the other thing that time series databases and their graphing partners can do is turn traces off and on. So often, again, we are not uh, dealing with not enough data, we're dealing with too much data. And so to be able to hide things and show things as you want to um, see things from a different perspective is very effective. So this is an example of where uh, now the wind data has been turned on and we can start to overlay wind speed and ambient temperature against the behavior of the controller and uh, start to see correlations like that is, is very obvious here. Um, it starts to teach us about cause and effect and about um, what the expected response of the system is and what the actual response ends up being. 
But time series analysis only gets you so far. One of the restrictions, of course, is the fact that everything's plotted against time. Um, there's other ways to slice and dice data. So uh, often these tools are restrictive and it's worthwhile jumping out. Now, one way to jump out is to uh, use a tool like Octave. And fortunately, um, InfluxDB and Octave play perfectly well together. You can export from InfluxDB and import into Octave. And so here's an example of what's something we might want to do in Octave. This is a, a cumulative sum over the course of a day of a particular uh, metric associated with a wind turbine. I'm never going to go into the specifics of what we're actually measuring here. It's not relevant um, to this presentation and, um, and it's not for me to, to, to say. But the important takeaway here is that by using a different tool, we can start to plot and slice and, um, and visualize the data in, in different ways. Uh, if we become constrained by the tool, we start to think that the things that the tool are showing us is reflective of reality. And in fact, all of these is it's a slice. It's a perspective on reality. So being able to jump out and quickly move into a, a, um, a powerful tool like Octave, uh, which has an enormous toolbox of, of data analysis and signal processing um, uh, uh, scripts, um, uh, starts to really, really uh, create a powerful, um, powerful tool in your toolbox. Um, the next graph here is uh, a community difference over the course of the day, um, plotted, overlaid with a four minute um, windowed average of wind speed. And they're the sorts of things that, uh, that are easy to dial up in a package like Octave. And once they're um, presented, um, start to cause you to think about the data in a new way and think about how the system is behaving in a new way. Um, and it's important, these tools, that they allow you to experiment. Because until this graph is produced, you wouldn't think, oh, you know what would be nice? A cumulative difference of the wind speed between comparative turbines overlaid with a four minute moving average of the, of the wind speed. You, you don't come up with that on day one, you come up after that after experimenting and, uh, and um, analyzing the data and progressively looking for, for factors that are going to be illuminating. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a useful combination of tools. Um, we use InfluxDB and its, and its partners extremely heavily um, but it's fantastic that we can then pull that out and dump it into a new tool and continue the visualization and, and, and the understanding process. So how might we use that in a, uh, a different scenario? Well, um, let's imagine again that we want to plot a different axis. Here is a histogram of, um, well, it's a histogram, I'm not going to talk about what it's, what's a, what it's a histogram of, but again, this is the same underlying data. There is about 2.2 uh, million data points that have gone into the calculation of this histogram, which takes approximately um, about four seconds or so to, to generate. Uh, so these tools are extremely powerful, and knowing that they're in your toolbox means that you can um, start to uh, pull um, uh, learnings out of the data um, that, uh, that otherwise would remain hidden. So when it comes to uh, a different problem, um, vastly different, here uh, in this house that we've just moved into, five meters away, uh, we have a smart meter. First house I've lived in with a smart meter, um, a very sophisticated device that takes high uh, rate um, measurements of the energy usage of this house uh, in uh, what, what can only be thought of as a great disappointment, uh, that data is not available to me as the householder. So instead, I have the option, and if I bring it up on the screen now, to pull down a subset of that data as provided to me by my retailer. Um, so no, I can't get it off the smart meter in its high fidelity uh, form. Um, that is taken away and sent off to the retailer and then I can download it in a series of, of daily CSVs. Um, this is, this is uh, um, frustrating, but at least we get access to some part of the data. So here in this uh, directory, I've got those daily um, CSVs that you can pull down from the, the retailer. Uh, and to give you a feel for uh, what's in there, um, if I do a word a line count of each of the files, you can see there's 24 rows in each one of these CSVs. That is uh, hourly energy consumption for every day um, uh, that I've pulled down the, the CSV for. Uh, very cumbersome way to extract the data. Uh, clearly, these these um, 
uh, commercial entities aren't expecting you, you to use the data in any particularly interesting way. Nonetheless, I, I can get access to it and then I can do something like uh, this Perl script if we have a look at the contents of, of that. Um, all it does is pull out the contents of those CSVs, merges them all, prints out a header which suits InfluxDB and then writes each row of the CSV in a format that suits um, InfluxDB's ingestion. Uh, and then if I run that, I get uh, this guy here, combine.csv. I can then pull that into influx. If I run influx, um, this is uh, influx uh, 2, um, by the way, that I'm running here, which is quite a bit different from where influx started. So it'll look a little bit different to the, uh, the previous one. Okay, so Influx is running and I can come back to my uh, browser and um, load that database uh, in the browser. To log in. That one there. And I've set up a dashboard here, so in Influx 2, the dashboarding and graphing um, features are built into the Influx visualization, which is a dramatic change. So here I've created a, a visualization on that data, uh, similar to how I would do it in Influx DB. Um, and if I look at If I look at this period of data here, which is the only period of data I've got, then I can do normal time series things. I can uh, aggregate the data in hourly segments, which is as the data is given. I can aggregate it in daily segments, and I can aggregate it in weekly segments. And maybe I start to see, have I got any trends? Were there things that were related to the, the time of the year? Were there things related to the weekend or the week? Um, can I see any sorts of patterns? I can start to try and um, learn more about that by doing these uh, histograms. So here the data is, is binned by hours, here it's binned by days, and here it's binned by weeks. Uh, and so I'm starting to look for patterns. There might be um, a, a different utilization depending on what time of the month it is, what day of the week it is. Um, so far I'm not really seeing a great deal that tells me how I might lower our energy usage or whether we're using energy in ways that, that um, we didn't expect. Um, here Influx even allows you to do uh, um, cumulative sums over the course of a period. So if there was a time that we were using energy at a greater rate than another time, then we might see a steeper section in the cumulative sum. But nothing's standing out to me here. Um, this is all very pretty and it's great that, that we have access to do this. But one of the limitations of the time series world is that every query on the data specifies a time period. And that turns out to be, even though it seems so obvious, turns out to be a fundamental limitation because it makes it very difficult to compare time periods, to overlay time periods and, and see if we can see some patterns forming if we start to align things um, based on, on recurring events over the course of, of the analysis period. So that's where the influx world starts to um, be restrictive and naturally we won't, might want to jump into the octave world. So if I jump back into um, octave here, so I've got a a, a, another script here, another Perl script, which generates the data useful for ingesting into Octave. Um, it works out to be very, very similar. Um, there's nothing fancy here. Uh, it's literally just pulling each of the in each of the CSVs and then spitting out one big CSV that has um, the data in the format that I want. So when I run that, I get a new CSV here that I can pull into Octave. And if I run Octave now. Um, before I do that, I'll just show you this, this little script, Octave script, um, that I was working on. 
Uh, it opens the CSV um, and then starts to analyze the data week by week and starts to overlay the data um, by week over on top of the previous weeks. Um, and this is something that, that is very, very difficult to do in the time series world, very easy to do in Optive. So if I run Optive now, and then run that script that I just showed you, process uh, CSV, then I get these fellas popping up. Now this one here, figure one, whoops, So this one here, figure one, uh, is nothing new. That's simply the time, the uh, the data plotted over time, exactly as you would see it in the influx DB world. Uh, if we put that one aside, this one is a bit more interesting. So this instead takes weekly segments over the course of a month. That's why you see four weeks here, uh, from Sunday to Sunday, uh, and plots successive weeks over on the top of each other. And this is when you start to see patterns forming. Um, you take a new slice uh, that is not limited by the, the tools that you have in front of you and uh, interesting um, uh, discrepancies start to pop out. So we see typically there's an elevated energy usage at the start of the day and at the end of the day, that classic diurnal uh, you know, duckbill um, curve. Um, where there's days where that doesn't happen, then you start to ask questions. Did we leave the air conditioner on all day? Um, were we uh, um, uh, using using electricity in a way that we didn't realize that we were using it? And you can start to answer those sorts of questions. So that's a classic um, application um, in my experience of these tools. Um, I now want to turn to uh, another data source. So once you have these tools, you know, it's great to be able to, uh, be able to use them. So here's another data source. This is my credit card bill. Um, let me just turn that off. Okay. So uh, our credit card bill was out of control, and this is a classic opportunity to analyze the data, try and understand the system. How is it responding? Um, what, uh, what behaviors are unexpected? Um, what can we tune? What can we tweak? How can we change our control algorithm? to get this particular data source back under control. Uh, and sure enough, once again, Woolworths has a, um, a, a beautiful visualization that is uh, borderline useless. So here I can see we, we spend far too much money. One thing that we spend too much money on is services, whatever services are. And um, there was a beautiful animation there um, and no useful information. So it looks pretty, but uh, I don't know what services are. Um, I can I can ask the same thing about travel. Why do we spend ninety one dollars on travel when we're not travelling at the moment? So if I have a look at that, oh, you mean I, I walked down to Maryville Tavern and, and had lunch, so that got, got categorised as travel. So it's a beautiful visualisation. It's very convenient, um, but you can't make decisions based on this. You can't you can't change your behaviour uh, based on the the data that's been provided. So. I want the data, I want to analyze the data and, and of course every time you go to do this the, the, the online tools typically make this harder and harder every time you do it. So uh, the way you do it now is that you open up the transaction list and then download all the transactions. Unfortunately <laughs> that only sh downloads the transactions on the screen and because it's 2021 this is an infinite scrolling screen so I'm just hitting <laughs> um, page down here and it's loading all my transactions under the screen. So I'm gonna fast forward through this bit because I have to page down all the way through um, the last couple of years of, uh, of transactions to, um, to get access to my CSV. But anyway, once I've done that, I have the CSV. I can actually start doing something interesting. Uh, so what might I want to do with that CSV? Okay, so I've got my CSV and I started with the normal tools. I actually thought, well, you know, I'm familiar with InfluxDB. It's a very powerful system. I'll just suck it into that and quickly found that it wasn't a very effective tool for analyzing this sort of data. 
uh, Octave to the rescue? Mm, perhaps not. Again, it, it, it wasn't really the, the tool that was giving me the insights that I needed. So I thought about the other tools in the toolbox and thought, well, um, this may suit Jupiter. Jupiter is, is another tool uh, in the data analysis world um, that uh, effectively packages um, Python with a, with a, with a live um, uh, browser-based script. So what I can do in Jupyter is uh, mix uh, text with um, uh, uh, runnable elements. So at the moment here, I'm on a text element and I can play that element and then run through the active elements in the script. So if I play this guy and play this guy, the next thing that happens, there was some prelim just setting up the environment, but the next thing that happens is that my CSV is imported. Um, there's a little bit of housekeeping done on that CSV, um, but quick as a flash, I now have all those credit card transactions um, imported into Jupyter. Now I can start and do some useful things. So I can crop the data, everything before uh, 2020, I'll remove, um, and I'll drop some um, some crap in there that's, that's really not useful to me. Um, I was subject to some uh, some misuse of the credit card last year. The um, Woolworths sorted it all out and refunded all the charges that um, that were due to, to fraudulent use. But I needed to uh, remove that data from my analysis, otherwise it would um, throw the results off. So this section here runs through all those fraudulent debits and makes sure that there's a corresponding chargeback credit um, to, uh, to rule it out. So you can see here for every uh, debit, there's a corresponding credit for these debits. Some of them came back out of order. So um, that's why it was useful to have this scripted um, because I didn't have to manually go through and, and match them all up. Next thing I do here is a whole bunch of recategorization. As you saw online, um, my trip to Maryville Tavern was categorized as travel. Uh, this is not useful. There was many, many, many of those um, incorrect auto uh, categorizations. So this section here just says, look, um, when you thought I was buying fuel and I spent less than $10, yes, I was at the servo, but that was just to get a, a snack. Um, when we're buying something from Domino's, that's actually fast food. Um, when uh, we're buying something from Best and Less, stick that in the personal expenses, yada, yada, yada. Uh, Football Federation is actually sport. Um, all these things that uh, that um, I wanted to automate so that every time I go back to analyze this data, all my preferences about categorizations are, um, uh, are scriptable and I can run them again. So I can run that again on, on a year and a half or so worth of data. The next thing, and this again was an exploratory process, I didn't really know what I was going to be looking at until I started to look at it. And I discovered that um, uh, at this point uh, I had some insights, but until I could reduce the number of categories, I wasn't going to be able to visualize um, the situation uh, well enough. So this section here merges categories. So it says everything that's in fast food, put that in a bigger category called fast food and restaurants. Also put snacks in there, also put restaurants in there. They all go into the same uh, um, major category. Um, Books and supplies, books and news, all these things, my subscriptions and uh, paper and whatnot, that all goes into a single category. Um, fees, clothes, group them, aggregate them into categories. And, and I uh, did this and redid this several times until I felt like I was getting enough fidelity in the categories, but enough aggregation that I could see the problem all at once. So I can run that now, um, quick as easy. This one here was just to make it make sure that I was, um, that the previous section had worked correctly. So it allows me to jump in and, and see that sure enough, every time we buy something from crust that gets categorized as fast food and restaurants. Um, and now we get into the interesting part. Uh, we can start to analyze it. So we can do very simple things like spit out credit card bill on a month to month basis. This is more of a sanity check. Yes, they those horrible numbers are what our credit card bill is each month. Um, and now we can start to do some plotting. So after some experimentation, this was the plot that turned out to be uh, most revealing, the best way to sort of communicate where we're going and, and what we're up to. So this is what Jupiter calls a, um, 
not what that, um, a pandas to cause a uh, area plot. Um, it's it's really a stacked line chart um, uh, where each category um, is stacked on top of each other, spaced out by months. And so we can see that when in the se middle section here, when we first moved into this house, we spent a hell of a lot, but the bulk of it, most things stayed roughly the same, but there was a huge increase in furnishings and maintenance. We bought a heap of furniture. Um, later on, uh, my wife started a, a sleep therapy course. And so we can see that in September, we also had a, a, a very, very high credit bill, but most of it was due to a, to a one-off um, purchase. Um, the most recent month, there's a big spike in this um, light blue, which is the sport and entertainment category. So I can do something like, um, tell me just what's in that sport and entertainment category. Why did that spike up most recently? So if I just dump that bit of data, I can see, oh yeah, in March, I went to the bike shop <laughs> and bought myself a, a very nice new bike. So I can start to understand both in aggregate and uh, specifics um, what the data is telling me. And we can decide whether there's some decisions that we can take so that we can influence the system um, and, and control it in the way that we want to control it. So that's all I wanted to go through today. So there's an example of three tools, Influx, um, Octave, and Jupiter, and the different ways that they allow you to slice and dice and analyze and learn from uh, time series data. Till next time, cheers.